Romans chapter 6. <laughs> Romans is, you know, probably the most theologically rich explanation, thorough, comprehensive explanation of the gospel in the New Testament. And we've been walking through it for some time. And the gospel um, is something that's hard to put an analogy to. Um, but as, as I've been thinking back and looking at pictures and remembering things about my dad, there's one that I heard that I thought would be fitting. And maybe even some of you might um, could fi find out. How many of you, is anyone here who would be willing to admit um, that you liked watching, not the new one, but the old Doctor Who series. We have a Doctor Who. Okay, I, I figured there was some, there, there might be some, I didn't want to stereotype certain age categories or anything, but, but my dad loved that old Doctor Who series, um, and uh, I think it was BBC or one of those, it was, a, a, um, uh, but Doctor Who had this time machine that on the outside looked just like a rickety old British telephone booth, but then when you went inside of it, it was big, and it, had, so it was a lot bigger on the inside than on the outside, and um, that's not a great analogy, but it is an analogy when we talk about the gospel, that sometimes we'll think of something on the outside, we're like, okay, this is the gospel, that Jesus died and was buried and was risen to give us new life, that we can have forgiveness in him, but then when we walk inside of it, it's so much bigger, and it, and it goes beyond time. It's the past, the present, and the future, and it goes through all of them, and so we're going to talk about that today. One of the most exciting, another picture of what this um, gospel is doing is pictured for us when we have the Christian ordinance of believer's baptism, and baptism is one of my favorite things about pastoring, um, and it is a visible display of someone's union with Christ. And the doctrine of the union with Christ, we're going to see explained for us in Romans 6, but it's all throughout the New Testament. In fact, if you're doing a Bible study, one of the best ways to find this is if you would maybe do your, your search with just the phrase, in him. And we saw several of those in Ephesians 1 in our call to worship. In him, what we are in Christ. And, and a good picture of that is if you imagine that you have a box that is Christ, and and everything you put in that box, wherever you take that box, everything, all the contents of that box go. Maybe your backpack or a lady's, your purse um, that has everything in it. Um, that, that it's in that purse. It's there in the contents. And when we are in Christ, everywhere Christ goes, we go. And the contents of being in Christ are there. And really when, some, really, when someone is baptized, they are saying, I'm with him. I am with Christ. And what one of the things we often say, at least in the tradition of this church and, and my background, is when someone's baptized, we would say, I'm baptizing you based upon your profession of faith. I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then as they're being baptized, or maybe before or after, the minister will often say, buried with him in baptism, as risen to walk in newness of life. And that little phrase there, buried with him in baptism, and risen to walk in newness of life, is taking that ordinance of baptism and letting it be a picture for us of our union with Christ. Because water baptism is an object lesson. It is a visual demonstration of a doctrinal truth concerning our union with Christ. And, um, one professor said it this way. He says, um, baptism is an object lesson, a visual demonstration of a doctrinal truth concerning union with Christ. And in Romans 6, Paul is not necessarily just writing about water baptism, but he is talking about the doctrinal truth that water baptism points to, and that is our union with with Jesus. And so this morning we're going to start a message that'll probably go in a couple weeks uh, on our union with Christ. So let's read the text together, Romans chapter 6. I'll read the first 12 verses. Romans chapter 6. 
This is God's word. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Did you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought into nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ, to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Father, would you help us now as we begin looking at this incredible text that is so much bigger on the inside than on the outside. Oh God, would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us spiritual eyes? And Lord, I pray that your spirit would illumine these truths and that it might change several Christians here that have been wrestling with besetting, indwelling sin for decades and that this day might be the day that you open their eyes to their union with Christ as the basis of which they would grow in their walk with Christ and that they might this this day might be a a, a tipping point of them growing and becoming like Christ i pray that this would be true for me and for those that would hear me today and lord i we want to be careful to give you the glory and we depend upon you to work now So, God, we trust you, and we thank you for what you'll do with this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we really need to remember the context when it says, what shall we say then, or how then shall we live? He is going back to this question that came up in the end of chapter 5. Therefore, verse 18, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men... So one righteous act leads to justification and life for all men. For by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's bringing up this logical argument about how does this doctrine of justification being saved and declared righteous and saved by faith alone, how does that affect how we live? It's really kind of a nice way of saying, so what? What's that supposed to do? And you might be in that. Sometimes we would say, okay, we've gone through all this doctrinal stuff in Romans. We've talked about all these spiritual things. I'm learning these things in these classes. What's that have to do with tomorrow morning? What's that have to do with the nasty now and now? How does that affect the struggle that you have with addiction or the relationship battles that you have or what's going on at work or the, 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 the draw that you have towards pornography or towards wrong relationships or towards gossip or towards the, the contention that's going on or schisms within the body or in your family? What, how, how, how does this help me? Every time I get around my family at this particular holiday, 
Uh, I, I just get so mad when so-and-so does this, when they do that, and I, how do I stop that? How do I get victory? And I'm just, I'm just wired that way. I mean, I took this, this personality test, and it came back J-E-R-K, and I just, that's just how I am. You know, uh, I, I'm Italian. I just get mad. I've got red hair. Therefore, I get mad and get upset at Thanksgiving dinner. I have no hair. Therefore, I get mad and upset at Thanksgiving dinner. I, and we, we make all these different things. Well, what am I supposed to do with that? Paul has talked to us about justification and all the benefits of it, but Paul's argument now is for a Christian lifestyle based upon the application of the gospel. And that, that teaching of, of, of living a gospel-centered life is most clear for us in this chapter of Romans. And there are three aspects of salvation that we need to understand. We've even sung this in that song, Complete in Him, that we are justified and that one day we will be glorified but right now we are in the process of being sanctified. Salvation is, as you maybe have heard before, is from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin and one day from the presence of sin. And Paul is going to talk about glorification or salvation from the presence of sin when we get to chapter 8. He has talked to us about justification or salvation from the penalty of sin in the previous chapters, especially chapters 4 and 5. But here in chapter 6, he's talking about the sanctification and how we can be saved, we are saved, from the power of sin right now. So justification brought about these benefits of peace with God and access to a permanent state of grace and rejoicing in hope even in the midst of suffering and then persevering that produces character and then a hope that won't be disappointed and then the love of God but Paul explains here that salvation, um, in putting it in this grand story like we saw last time, that it's relevant to everybody, that we understand the connection between Adam's sin and our guilt and Christ's righteousness and our justification. He gave us this whole storyline of the Bible, the two Adams. And so as we concluded chapter 5, that these two Adams made the most impact in all of human history and the impact of the second Adam is the greater and the longer lasting. And the solution to our being in Adam was to be in the second Adam. And so the two realms in which are we in union with? Are you in union with Christ? And so then as we know that we are in him and in union with Christ in salvation, what does that have to do with the here and now? What this chapter does is it gives us hope for the future that the gospel that we receive for salvation affects the way we live until we attain that hope of glorification so he unfolds how the union with Christ affects our Christian walk and he does this by giving us three main ideas in this chapter and I'll work, categorize it that there are some things we need to understand or know uh, maybe, and there are some things we need to consider or reckon, and there are some things we need to do or yield or present. And that's going to be our outline, but we'll probably just get to the first one of those this week. So union with Christ, everything else flows out of this. You get that, that the chief benefit, the primary benefit of salvation is that we are that we get Christ. He that has the Son has life. He who doesn't have the Son has, doesn't have life. That removal from the penalty of sin and not, going, not receiving the penalty of sin in hell and having hope of eternal life, those are incredible, and, and the hope of heaven, those are incredible side benefits of salvation. But the primary benefit is that we get Christ that we get reconciliation to him and that we are put in him, that we're baptized into Christ. We're in that box. We are in Christ. And, the, and this is it. So he, Now, if you'll notice as we read the beginning verses of, of chapter 6, there is a repeated word that came up in verse 3, verse 6, and verse 9. He said in verse 3, he said, Do you not know? And then in verse 6, he says, We know that our old self. And then in verse 9, he says, We know. Paul is telling us that there is something we need to know. There are some things we need to know about our union with Christ. 
um, through this union with Christ, we can overcome sin in our daily life. And he wants us to know and understand things. See, this shows us that Christian learning affects Christian living. That you want Bible teaching. Sometimes people will say, oh, I don't want all the doctrinal stuff. I want the practical stuff. You would disagree with Paul and the entire New Testament with that. Because it is the Christian learning that leads to Christian living. Teaching is the main part of Christian discipleship. Go in all the world and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What's next? Teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. So this duty of doing in the Christian life to, follows the doctrine of what we know. Paul wants us to know some things about our union with Christ. There's some things we need to get about our union with Christ. The things we need to know. And the first I want to point out in verses 1 and 2, shall we continue to sin? What shall we say then? Are we continuing to sin? The, by no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? He's wanting to point out to us that there is a relationship between justification and sanctification. That those are just big words for what God has done for us in the past, what he's doing now in our lives. The talk of justification in chapter 5 brought up this question, how then shall we live in this current stage of life? And it shows that this is the natural thought that comes about. And, and I've actually heard people say, if you're not presenting the gospel in a way that makes people think, well, can we just keep sinning that grace may abound, then you're probably not presenting the gospel in a biblical way because it leads to that natural reasoning. But natural reasoning often perverts the truth, which is why we need God to tell us something in his word. And so from chapter 5, verse 20 and 21 that we read, that this, this, if, if the multiplying sin is always outmatched by more multiplication of God's grace, then well, let's just keep sinning. That grace gets multiplied more. And he's saying, no, the grace that believers receive is so powerful that it breaks the power of sin. And you might think, well, who would think this way? Well, there's some actual real examples of that. In the Bible, you can just go to the book of 1 Corinthians and see people that think this way. In 1 Corinthians 5, there is this church that literally sees nothing wrong with with rampant sexual sin that is known in the church. And they're saying that it's a display of Christian unity and Christian liberty in the church. There was actually a monk that worked with the Romanov family in Russia that had ideas about this that that this that the, the, the more we sin and the more we get into like the craziness of sin the more grace is multiplied sometimes christians will talk about their testimony or who they want to to work with their children and youth, uh, and youth workers with this idea oh so and so would be so much more effective because they have such a terrible past and you're like Okay, but we don't minister to people from experience. There's certain sins that you can only commit once. You can't find someone who's committed that sin to help you not commit that sin. You know, like self-murder might be one or something like that. But we sometimes will have this idea that, man, we need to find somebody or, or, man, we just need to go sin more so that we can have more effectiveness in ministry. That is not what the Bible's teaching. This was even an accusation against Luther during the Reformation that he was accused of being antinomian and the antinomian, nomos, law, anti, against the law. That you're lawless because he's teaching that people could be saved by faith alone, apart from works. And Luther was very clear to say and insist that that he believed in salvation by faith alone, but not by a faith that was alone. That a salvation will produce good works Um, so justification and sanctification are theologically distinct and we don't have time to go into all of the distinctions of that but they are practically inseparable so justification is a judicial act by God sanctification is this moral work inside of a believer justification is this imputed righteousness Sanctification, based upon the Westminster Confession, is that it is an imparted righteousness. 
Justification is, is our legal position. Sanctification is our daily experience. Justification removes the guilt of sin. Sanctification is removing the pollution of sin. Justification is canceling the penalty of sin. Sanctification is defeating the power of sin. So they're distinct, but they can't be separated. The Bible actually gives us a, a few different ideas of sanctification that we often use the phrase that we're this positional sanctification, that we're declared righteous, that there's this ultimate sanctification that we're glorified, and there's a sense in which that's already and not yet. But then there's this progressive sanctification where we're working with the Holy Spirit and growing from one degree of glory to the other. Now, so they are distinct, but they cannot be separated. Get that, that your salvation and your growth as a Christian are connected. And so Paul's argument for a Christian lifestyle is based upon the application of the gospel. It's not an afterthought. Now get this. This is chapter 6. How many chapters are in Romans? Okay, okay. We're in the team. This is not like, okay, by the way, you're not supposed to live lawlessly. This is right in the middle of the book. This is a major concern that Paul's bringing up. That where, where, where this is in the middle of the letter. Sanctification is the necessary effect of justification. Now, both sanctification and justification require the grace of God. Both require faith in the blood and the righteousness of Jesus. Both require the Holy Spirit to apply God's grace. Sanctification is this initial and positional, this part of salvation. Or, uh, the, 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 that's what justification is. Sanctification is this ongoing part. They are connected. The atoning work of Christ is the ground of our justification, and it is also the ground of our sanctification. And this is why we talk about the importance of being gospel-centered in our living. We are to live in the reality that we are in Christ. Paul would say this in a different way in Colossians. He says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. We're to live in this reality. Sanctification flows from our justification. Union with Christ is the basis of sanctification. Let me say it a different way. Your being in Christ in the gospel and your salvation is the basis in which you grow practically as a Christian. They're not separated. And sometimes we have these different ideas that that my growth is, your growth as a Christian is about your willpower, your discipline, you're being in a steps program, you're being around certain people in a program with accountability, and all those spiritual disciplines are part of that, but it's all to be grounded in the reality of our union with Christ. Many think that gaining victory over sin comes down to the circumstances we're in. You know, if I didn't have this person around, if I was in this different environment, if I went to a different school, if I had a different job, if I had a different spouse, if I had a different job, if I had a different car, if I had a different circumstance, if I had different parents, if I had a different temperament, if I had different chemicals in my brain, then I would grow. And they, or, I, or they think that, it's, that growing is based upon like psychological tricks or personal resolve or be determined to win over against temptation. But that, but I, again, I, so I just want to ask you, how is all that working for you as a Christian? It's probably not. And you're probably living in a defeated life, and there's certain sins that just keep coming back in your soul. They might not be to the extent that they were a, decades ago, or have the expression, maybe you've learned from some consequences of some of those things, but you still feel that, 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 that sin rearing up inside of you. And efforts in sanctification grounded in human resolve often end up failing. And then we get frustrated. And what Paul is saying is kind of like what one um, teacher that, um, that I respect says, that right thinking about the gospel produces right living in the gospel. So what Paul is basically saying to us here in the first few verses of Romans 6 is that you need to know some things about your union with Christ. Because you thinking right, rightly, about your union with Christ and about the gospel is going to affect how you live in the gospel. So right thinking about the gospel is going to produce right living in the gospel. 
So the one thing we need to know is the fact of our union with Christ. There is no chance for holiness or growth in your Christian life apart from spiritual union with Christ. So when someone comes and says, Jason, can we get some counsel from you about this area of life or money, relationship, whatever? It's like, we can give you, tell you what the Bible says and principles about that that might help with some circumstances or how you're doing stuff. But ultimately, apart from you having a relationship with Christ and salvation, it's going to be failed. A failure. You need Christ. Everything comes down to this, you being in Christ. This makes Christianity unique because in natural religion, men try to live holy lives in order to get to God. In Christianity, men live holy lives after they've gotten God. So you don't have to live a certain way to get to a relationship with God. You get a relationship with Christ, and because of that, you'll live a certain way. It's the opposite. This makes Christianity unique from everyone. Every believer partakes in all the benefits of Christ, what Christ has accomplished for us in his atoning death on the, on the cross. Jesus purchased forgiveness. He purchased peace and joy and eternal life. And the list of benefits goes on and on. And it is all offered to you in Christ. He is doing this so that he can present himself a glorious church. His burial, his separation from the world, life in Christ demands and gives us this, that we're separated from the world. And so sanctification is nothing more than living in the reality of what we have in Jesus in the gospel. Or I heard someone say, sanctification is just the Christianizing of the Christian. It's just catching up what we already have inside. So verse 2, it says, Do you not know or verse 3, rather. Do you not know? This is first, no. You need to know this, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. You need to know something about you, the fact of your union with Christ, that we died to sin, that we need to know that we are united to the death of Christ. Paul clearly isn't holding to some, like, you're under grace, so therefore do whatever you want mentality. Modern Christianity is rampant with that type of idea. That anyone who takes holiness seriously is labeled some type of prude or legalist or out of touch with reality. And we love and we believe that Jesus takes us just as I am, but the gospel tells us that he loves us too much to leave us there because Jesus doesn't save us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. So our union with Christ involves the crucifixion of the Savior and our sin one of the like this is one of the fruits of salvation is that we are now living free from sin and when christ died we died to sin and burial with christ involves separation from the world and that this doesn't mean that a believer can't sin anymore it means that our our relationship with sin has fundamentally changed that that drive of sin is now cut off because our relationship with sin is different now I don't know how many of you have ridden like four-wheelers or dirt bikes or tractors, uh, but when it, you have to pull the clutch in to change gear, whether that's on the, uh, on the hand, you pull the clutch in, or on a tractor, you'll, you have to push the clutch down to change gears. So when you, when, but when you're in a situation where you get nervous, maybe you're going around a corner, you're pulling something with a tractor, and we're doing this as a kid, you get nervous, and you mash the brakes. And... But the engine's still moving it. And so you can mash that. You're going to wear the brakes out, but it's going to keep moving. I remember one time we, we had a four-wheeler, and then my dad bought a, a used four-wheeler from a kid that had played football for him. And this kid, it was like a racing four-wheeler. And it was like way too much juice for um, a 12-year-old. That was me. And this thing could like come out of jumps, and it could just, it could run like 80, 90 miles an hour. It was like too much. And, and I remember being super scared because that thing's going and you're like, you're nervous, so you're hitting the brakes. But then you're like, oh, I got to pull the clutch because that engine's just going to keep moving. And sometimes, and this, so there's a little bit of an analogy for us here that, that you've got this sin in your life that you're struggling with. And what you need to realize is that in Christ, in your union with Christ, that you are united with the death of Christ. It is, you can be dead to sin. You can pull the clutch. You can push the clutch. You can turn off that drive because you know the power's not there anymore. That that power doesn't control you. You don't have 
to sin because you're dead to sin. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. He uses this reference to baptism. Now, some see this as only a reference to the whole, baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. Some see it as an ordinance. I believe it can be both. The majority of commentators think that it refers to water baptism um, at the point someone is joined to Christ. But the reference, what's important is he's talking about those that are believers in Christ. And so one of the ways we can help understand this is to putting ourselves in somewhat the shoes of understanding what the first readers would have seen this. And in the New Testament, unbaptized Christians was virtually something that was non-existent. If you were a Christian, meant you were baptized. And so Tom Schreiner says it this way, to refer to those who were baptized in another way is another way of describing those who are Christians, those who have put their faith in Christ. We do the same thing with church membership. Church membership is for Christians. Well, how do we know who's a Christian? Well, those that have been baptized. That's how we know who those are, those that have identified with Christ publicly. The visible sign that someone has become a Christian is not that they raise their hand, walk an aisle, fill out a card. The visible sign that someone's believed and put their faith in Christ is when they've identified with Christ and believer's baptism. And so we are died with Christ in, we have died with Christ in baptism. Um, believe, baptism bears an identity. Baptism is an identity of being united with him. So for some, historically, and even currently, when they are baptized as a Christian, their family disowns them, treats them as dead. Some even offer funeral services when someone becomes a Christian for their family. For others, it is historically and presently in some places in the world a mark of persecution for those who are baptized as Christians. For some, when they are baptized is actually when they're given a new name. And it's kind of an object lesson for us with our union with Christ. It's our identity. When we're baptized in Christ, we are with him. We are in him, showing our union with Christ. So, so there, there's an um, incompatibility between being baptized into Christ and remaining in sin. When you were baptized into Christ spiritually, you were baptized into his death. Um, baptism pictures for us our identification with Christ and his death his burial, and his resurrection. Historians virtually all agree that the mode of baptism in the early church was immersion. Was immersion. And immersion especially pictures this death, burial, and resurrection. Our death to sin at baptism makes it possible for us to live a new life. Um, so whatever was legally true of Jesus became now legally true of, for us, right? So we're buried with him and risen with him. We're in the box. We're in Christ. We have new identity. We're in Christ. You don't have to live the old way. You're in Christ. So the design of our union with Christ, we see in verses 5 to 7, for if we've been united with him in a death like him, we shall be certainly be united with him in a resurrection with him. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Sharing in Christ's death means sharing in Christ's victory and life. So this is, we're free from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, one day the presence of sin, so subjectively, prophetically. It's as if, he says, we have, he says that we, we have this here, that we have been set free from sin. Verses four and five say that he, we share in Christ's resurrected life. What God did for Christ in raising him from the dead, he also does for believers at conversion. He liberates us from sin and gives us resurrection life. Um, Warren Wiersbe said it this way. He said, too many Christians are betweeners. They live between Egypt and Canaan, saved but never satisfied. They live between Good Friday and Easter, believing in the cross but not entering into the power and the glory of the resurrection. 
And Romans 6 verse 5 indicates that our union with Christ assures us of future resurrection. So we, can li- we have this power of the resurrected body. The, pr- the power of the resurrection that gives us freedom from the power of sin in our lives. So he says, he that is dead is freed from sin. You notice that the Bible tells us we are freed from sin. We're not freed to sin. We're freed from sin. Sin and death no longer have dominion over us. We are in Christ. And therefore, sin and death have no dominion over us in Christ. We died for sin so that we can die unto sin. Now, there is tremendous application in this doctrine of union with Christ. And there's a lot of that we're going to see when we, from verses 11 through the end of the chapter. And all of this theology has an application for us. God doesn't reveal for us something to be true unless he has a reason for it. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And we need to believe that every part of scripture is profitable. And so there's a link between what we see here about our union with Christ and how we live. And I think the link here is in verse 8. If you look at it with me, verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live in him. Do you really believe that you are in Christ in his death and that you are in Christ in his resurrection? Do you really believe that? This is the link. And the value of our faith is determined by the object of our faith. That God has done this in Christ. He's told us this in his word. And so, sanctification doesn't progress. We don't grow in our walk with God by self-determination or willpower. If we are to grow, as it will be because we've believed these truths about our union with Christ. And he'll talk about a way we do that in our mind. We'll use this word consider or reckon. But let me close with this thought. There's an illustration I learned a long time ago. I thought it's a great illustration I've shared before. Imagine you are living in a house that's owned by somebody else and you're a renter. And let's say he's Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith owns the house and you let's imagine it's the old days when you wrote paper checks and handed it to somebody and Mr. Smith comes and he asks for the rent every month and you write a check to Mr. Smith and every month you kind of get used to when he steps on the front porch that you're supposed to give Mr. Smith the check right Mr. Smith sells the house to Mr. Jones Mr. Jones is now your landlord and you're a renter to Mr. Jones so now when Mr. Jones comes to the house the house is under new management When Mr. Jones comes, you give the check to Mr. Jones. So imagine that this transaction took place and Mr. Smith sold the house to Mr. Jones and a couple months go by. You've been paying the last couple rent checks to Mr. Jones. And Mr. Smith comes on the front porch and says, I'm here to get my check. What do you say to Mr. Smith? You can write a check if you want. And you can hand it to him. Or you can say to Mr. S- Mr. Smith, you don't own this house anymore. Mr. Jones owns this house. It's under new management. You can go pound sand, Mr. Smith. I'm not giving you a check. You can say it nicer than that. But, 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 but you don't have to write him that. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, you are under new management. You are not under sin. You are in Christ. You are in his death to sin, in his resurrection of the, in the power of, over sin, and when sin, when Satan tempts you to despair, when, when temptation comes your way, you say, I don't have to give you a rent check. I'm in Christ. The power of his resurrection is in me. I can say no and yield to the righteousness that the gospel has imputed to me. And I hope that the, you understanding this glorious truth of your union with Christ will be the basis of your sanctification, that every bit of your growth in Christ is going to be rooted in the gospel. So there are some things 
for your walk with God that you need to know about your union with Christ. We've looked at some of those today. These are the things that can help break the power, that you don't have to break the power. The clutch can be disengaged. You don't have to just hit the brakes of self-discipline. It strains too much. Eventually, your endurance runs out. The power of the engine needs to be broken. And what breaks the power of that sin engine is the gospel and our union with Christ. So in your union with Christ, the power of sin has been broken. And you need to know this. And as verse 8 says, you need to believe this. And living free from sin is one of the purposes that we're saved. We're saved from sin. So next time you're tempted, you're in Christ. And then next time we're together, we'll go further in this chapter and see how we can reckon this to be true in our practical day-to-day lives. Let's pray together.